Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining today. Um, as we are kind of letting people into the waiting room, we're going to give it just a few minutes before we get started. Yes, thank you, Joan, for putting a greeting in the chat. Feel free to introduce yourselves to others, um, where you're from and um, organizations, universities, and where you're joining us from today. Great, Jihi, if you think things look good to go, we'll go ahead and get started. Perfect. Well, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. Um, on behalf of the Online Events Committee, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first International Association for Feminist Economics event of 2022. My name is Mary Barlman. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a feminist ec economist at the International Center for Research on Women, or ICRW. Today's event is going to be the first of a Building Bridges series we're hosting this year, which will open space for conversation and relationship building between academics and advocates, activists, and policymakers. We will also be hosting events on feminist economic research methods and with our young scholars in IAFI Academy on building a career as a feminist economist, so please keep an eye out for additional events to come. A few logistical pieces for today's panel. Today's event, as you saw when you joined, will be recorded and it's going to be posted on YouTube. As this is a Zoom call and not a webinar, a friendly reminder to all to keep yourselves muted. And then later we will have a chance for Q&A in the session. So um, feel free to post your questions in the chat throughout if you'd like to kind of create interactions. Or um, once we do get to the Q&A, you can use the raise hand function. Our amazing IAFI staff member, Jihi, will help us moderate those questions as that time comes up. Thanks, Jihi. And now I wanna to turn to some framing for today's event. Though care is incredibly context specific, COVID has exacerbated inequalities in both paid and unpaid care in intersectional ways across the globe. As someone who began studying feminist economics over two decades ago, I know that feminist economists have long been highlighting the central nature of care issues, both for gender equality and also for sustainable and inclusive economies. But it has taken the devastating impacts of a global pandemic to bring the importance of care to the forefront of awareness and policy making to this extent. In my role at the International Center for Research on Women, I sit as the technical lead for a new global coalition on women's economic empowerment. And I've also been ICRW's representative for the newly formed Global Alliance for Care, which we'll hear more about later today. Within the global women's economic empowerment space, issues related to paid and unpaid care are at the forefront of agendas across civil society partners and international organizations. And there's been a marked increase in commitments from governments, international financial institutions, and even large philanthropic donors around paid and unpaid care. As it would, we then begin to think about how we can truly foster progress on care at a global level, which supports the 5R framework to recognize, reduce, redistribute, reward, and represent care, 
The goal for today was to bring together panelists that can share insights with us across the spectrum of theory to policy to implementation in order to take stock of where things stand and as the event title states, strategize together on how best to seize this moment of increased attention to care. Given how critical care issues are due to COVID, this will be an opportunity to share reflections on how to support meaningful change in care outcomes and create more inclusive economies from a feminist economics perspective. It is my honor to introduce the panelists for today's event. Um, we have Dr. Valeria Esquivel, an employment policies and gender specialist at the International Labor Organization. Dr. Nancy Fulbray, Professor Emerita of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and Director of the Program on Gender and Care Work at the Political Economy, Economy excuse me, Research Institute. Unfortunately, Dr. Ipek Ilkarakan was unable to join us today as she's not feeling well. So let's all send our best wishes her way that she feels better soon. We're also joined by Emilian de Leon, an expert consultant for In Mujeres, the National Institute for Women in Mexico, and representative of the Global Alliance for Care. And last but not least, we have Amar Nijawan, a women's rights policy and advocacy specialist in economic justice at Oxfam Canada. So I'm first going to turn to Nancy Fulbright. Nancy, you've been a pioneer in the area of care with research spanning decades. The core of which is focused really on issues of value across the spectrum of unpaid to paid care, such as the care penalty. As you sit back and kind of assess the increased awareness that COVID has brought to care issues, as well as the exacerbation of inequalities in both unpaid and paid care, what aspects of these core theoretical issues around care are you seeing well reflected in policy conversations? And where are you really seeing these approaches missing the mark? And my kind of second part of this question is, what does a feminist economic approach to care entail within these discussions? First of all, a many thanks to Ayafi in general and, and Mary um, Borrowman and, and Jihi Jolly in particular for organizing this. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what people have to say. And um, it's a really great lineup of, of participants. You know, I, I feel really grateful to be part of a long international trajectory of socialist feminism that dates back to at least the early 19th century and will hopefully date forward for a long time to come. And I am especially grateful for a younger generation of scholars and activists who are just seem incredibly fearless and creative in advancing a, a vision of gender equality that could, can, should also strengthen efforts to move towards a more cooperative and sustainable economic system. And I see the, the care frame as one that really strongly aligns uh, gender equality and that larger vision of a more uh, cooperative and sustainable system. You know, the, the pandemic imposed huge costs uh, on both unpaid and paid caregivers. And it also exposed really huge weaknesses in our, our care infrastructure. And I see a lot of increased awareness of this on the left. Um, and I see it kind of reconfiguring the progressive agenda in some very positive ways. So, you know, here in the US, it's hard to be optimistic about um, the fate of the Democratic Party's Build Back Better legislation. Uh, but it, at least it laid out a really coherent kind of unified vision of, of, of public policies um, that kind of um, sets us up to pursue pieces of it um, more, hopefully more successfully in the near future. And, you know, I see elsewhere in the, in the world, some really positive signs, some real causes for optimism. And I think um, the kind of feminist and care-centered policies that Gabrielle Boric um, advocated and the, his successful bid for the Chilean presidency is a, is a really good example of a, a, a hopeful um, change. And, and there are many others uh, around the world. But I think Mama. The, <laughs> the, the, um, the, the global pandemic, I think, has also revealed weaknesses in our public discourse. Um, I, I kind of want to think beyond particular policies. 
And I think it's re also revealed weaknesses in our understanding of social conflict. And I have been very deeply humbled um, by the very visible and tangible kind of every man for himself anger and kind of shocking lack of concern for public health. It's widespread in the US and also uh, many other countries. You know, I've never been a big fan of traditional economic assumptions about rational economic man, but uh, I think I have a new appreciation of just how irrational and self-destructive people can be, but women and, and men, can, how just how uh, loony people can be in the face of unexpected shocks and stresses. And that has given me a really intensified respect for social norms of cooperation and mutual respect and care. So I guess, you know, my main thought is that in, in terms of uh, thinking about care is I think we need to really um, grapple more effectively, think harder about the forces that strengthen or weaken these social norms. And as you might guess, I, I, I largely blame the kind of toxic legacy of economic institutions that reinforce competitive individualism and economic theories that romanticize the individual pursuit of self-interest. But I don't think that a critique of patriarchal capitalism or whatever um, term you wanna use to describe the sort of existing institutional order, I don't think that critique takes us far enough uh, if it only looks at gender and class. I think uh, race, ethnicity, citizenship, nationality, and a lot of other aspects of group membership are really, um, have really come into play in very, in very visible ways in, in, as a, in, in ways that have been dra dramatized by, by the, the pandemic. So I think there are a lot of different forms of inequality that lead to distributional struggles that not only impose really huge social and economic costs, but also, and maybe this is the most important part, they, they really undermine our ability to cooperate in addressing truly global problems like a pandemic or, or climate change. And I think our, our vulnerability in responding to these external shocks is a big part of what we need to um, address. You could think of it, I don't know, in some ways the, it's the, the larger problem is a problem of non-care. Um, and uh, whatever we can do to dramatize that and, and understand it better, I think um, is really important. So that's, I guess, that's why I think it's really important to develop and expand a kind of intersectional political economy that, that, that really focuses on understanding social division and not, not just understanding it, but experimenting with ways to form different kinds of progressive coalitions that we really, really, really need in order to take better care of ourselves and, and the future of the planet. Thanks. Thank you. And just as a kind of quick follow up, I think, you know, again, getting back to these issues of, of kind of core value, do you feel like as we're, you know, in these conversations that there is actually a real reckoning happening amidst these discussions of care, or is it kind of getting lost in terms of more like instrumentalist framings of kind of getting back women back to work to kind of support the economy? You know, like, are we reckoning with the value of care? Or is it just kind of an awareness that care matters in some way? I think it's both. I mean, I think there's a partial and incomplete reckoning, but you know, we whatever little cracks and crevices we can find, we need to, you know, we need to climb up that that steep rock wall, and not. I don't. I, I think you know, instead of uh, constantly trying to assess whether we're making progress or not, not we sort I think we sort of need to keep our eyes on. A long run goal and realize it's it's actually really hard to tell a lot of the time whether you're making progress or not. You have to keep going no matter what. I hear that. And I think that's those are really powerful reflections in terms of how we think about social norms, kind of the way that we react with each other and communities. And, and I really like this framing of the kind of intersectional political economy, right, as we go forward and, and how we respond to shocks. 
Um, so I'll end there, but we'll be able to hear more from you later in the discussion. Thank you, Nancy, for those, those great reflections. Um, we're now gonna have the opportunity to hear from Valeria Esquivel. Um, Valeria, your research and work both at the ILO and prior has surveyed the landscape of care policies across the globe. The care work and care jobs for the future of decent work, which Jihi is gonna drop in the chat for us, and I hear is about to be updated as well. Um, was a report that you co-authored and which was really comprehensive in its assessment of the looming care crisis prior to COVID and the benefits that can be realized by investments in care sectors. The question to start off with for you today is, has the pandemic changed this view? Thank you, Mary. Uh, thank you all and, and wonderful to, to be here. Uh, the pandemic has if, if, if anything, reinforced uh, our view uh, put forward uh, like almost five, yeah, four years ago, that these investments in care se sectors are more urgent and, and necessary uh, than ever. At that point, uh, we took the SDGs uh, as as our, as our horizon, if you want. And in work uh, that we did along with IPEC and Kijong Kim, uh, we showed that investments in these sectors to reach the SDGs in education and health, not to do um, um, pie in the sky um, things, but, but to, to, to accompany the, 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 the objectives that the countries had signed for in 2015, could create uh, jobs in the care sectors. The care sectors as a whole would go from 206 million jobs to 326 million jobs, but that these investments could generate indirectly new jobs in other sectors that provide um, to these sectors to reach 475 million jobs by 2030. Uh, in between then and now, there was a huge crisis. So, so we might, if anything, we, we need more of those investments in the coming years to compensate for the less, uh, the fewer investments uh, in some places in, 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 in the past two years. Of course, some countries, especially those with high incomes have ramped up um, investment in health, but not necessarily in education and other um, care related infrastructure. Um, the, the, in fact, the Secretary General of the UN has called uh, last year uh, to, um, for the creation of 400 million jobs in the care and the green economies, um, especially uh, because these, would, these investments would increase resilience, help uh, um, uh, transition uh, and, 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 and cater for um, climate change. And also because these sectors have the potential to create relatively more employment for women uh, who you may know have been the hardest hit by uh, the COVID crisis. Um, so we, we see, and by we, I mean the ILO, um, we see investments in care sectors as one of the ways out of um, the, the pandemic, the crisis, one of the ways to kick off and, and, and um, sustain uh, recovery. And a more just, more fair, a more gender responsive recovery by doing this. Uh, one other, one other, more conceptual thing that I think that that the the pandemic um, reinforced, if you want, is that um, typically and and Mary, you cited the five R framework at the beginning of your of, of, of your presentation, but typically um, the focus of care on care workers 
was really on early childhood education and long-term care, because these are the typically deficitarian sectors or, or services in high-income countries. And we took a broader um, um, view on, on care workers that included health care workers or health workers as a whole in the sector and, and not only long-term care and the whole of the education sector and not only early childhood education. And the, the pandemic proved that these, the care, the care economies um, comprises the whole of the health sector and the whole of, of education and that without health and without education and without these workers and decent work for these, uh, these workers, the world just stops. So I think um, it has reinforced uh, our views, if, if anything, and, and the urgency. Absolutely, and thank you for those reflections on both yeah, understanding the impacts and how it reinforces, reinforces that, but also thinking about how we can then get out of um, the pandemic in a way that is more sustainable and inclusive. Um, from there, what insights can you share with us regarding thinking about these implementation issues of policy? I, I would I would connect with with something that Nancy said about uh, about keeping on going uh, in, in in spite of setbacks and also um, finding those good examples and and certainly um, uh, Nancy mentioned the case of Chile uh, but in general I would say that the the experience in, in Latin America and the, the progress in the, the care um, agenda has, has had there um, has not only had a demonstration effect, but also hints into uh, implementation in the, in the form of what is what in Latin America have been called care systems. And, and care systems um, work across sectors and, and, and allow for uh, populations to be, or beneficiaries to be covered without falling through the cracks. They have, again, cross-sectoral institutional um, um, organizations in ways that there is cooperation in the, and, and synergies uh, between those who uh, put forward different care policies. Um, and also, and very importantly, have a, a rights-based and gender, uh, even feminist, take on, on, on the design of the policies. So of course the challenge has been and is still um, the, the implementation, the universalization of, of um, services, uh, but, but the view, starting working with the view of universality and, and with, with a lot of respect to or for um, pet carers and, and care workers has been the way forward, even if it is slow, even if there are setbacks, um, uh, even if it takes time to implement. I think that, um, that the example of some Latin American countries, Uruguay, Argentina, um, Mexico, hopefully Chile, Colombia, uh, trying to, to do some work, sometimes even in cities like in Bogota or Mexico City, is one uh, positive development and one way uh, to follow. Thank you so much, Valeria. And I think this will be a really amazing transition to um, our next speaker, um, Emilien. Um, he's going to also speak to, to some of kind of big picture things, right? I think both of you and Nancy have, have talked about thinking about things in terms of the long run goals, right? And the kind of big picture of things. Um, and Emilien, now you're um, with us today as a representative of the Global Alliance for Care. And, and this Global Alliance for Care emerged as a collective commitment at the Generation Equality Forum, um, where care was one of four priority areas under the Economic Justice and Rights Action Coalition. Now the Global Alliance for Care now has 12 governments and many philanthropic and private sector, civil society and international organizations on board. 
this is, you know, something to really take note of in the care space, right? This is the first uh, major development is the first multilateral body on care. So my question to start off with for you today, or a series of questions, I guess, is what can you tell us about why this arose now, right? Why was this the time that we're seeing this emerge? The process of how this developed um, and what areas under the broad umbrella of care issues, right? The spectrum of unpaid care to paid care, there are a lot of issues that we could talk about have the greatest potential for concrete action, especially in the near term. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Um, just to let you know, we have now 52 members and this has been launched in March uh, during the Generation Equality Forum by the Mexico government through the National Institute of Women. And I think we have the fortune to have a feminist there leading that. And she has been working hard on the care agenda. So I think seeing the situation, COVID opening this window, no, the COVID has bring a lot of bad things, but I think one of the good things is opening this window to realize how care is important for the economies and, and building care societies is something that that we need to do. So she with uh, with UN Women launched, Mexico and, and UN Women launched this. And by July in the second phase of the Gender Equality, uh, um, Generation Equality Forum, we had already like 30 members. So I think we are in a momentum after decades of the feminist movements and feminist economies like you pushing a lot on the care agenda this is the momentum and I think it was like a tipping point where everything comes together and it it's, has a lot of expectation. We have been working hard to bring people from different sectors. And I think that itself, it's a challenge because there are governments, but as well civil society organizations and corporate sector, which has not been so easy to bring and are still wondering how to implement these kind of policies in their own companies, also international institutions like I, ILO, ECLAC, that has been working a lot in Latin America on this issue. I would say that the regional gathering of ECLAC this year is going to be around care, <clears throat> and Argentina is going to lead that. So that's something that it's also emerging in parallel. So I would say there were many things that come together, and it was a great momentum. So the, the Global Alliance for Care has uh, five areas of or action areas. No? So what we mean, well, uh, first of all, we want to be a very participatory space where people can exchange, connect, disseminate, and promote the care agenda globally. No? So uh, one, of the, one of the areas is to create communities of practices and sharing experiences among governments, uh, uh, researchers, international institutions, civil society organizations that can help others to understand how to begin their work or implement some policies. No? Another layer is around uh, having a repository of research and data that could link all, for example, you are wonderful researchers that have done a lot of work on this, so we could have connections to any one of, of you and many others. This is also to see how the, the academia can really help more for the practitioners and the activists and even the policy makers to understand how better to implement these care policies. We have within the civil society sector, especially organizations, international organizations at this moment of care workers. So we have the International Coalition of uh, uh, Domestic Workers, WIRU Commission, the, uh, uh, and, and some others that are working together. And, one of the things that are emerging, we have another action area on bilateralism, multilateralism actions that means also an advocacy actions that means also how governments could cooperate in a bilateral way to other governments that need more support to develop. And uh, finally, we have the communications area that will look for supporting some communications advocacy uh, projects within some governments of some countries. And finally, how to sustain the, the and outreach more people because we have 52 and we, have, we know that maybe in one or two months we will have 60, 65 because we are talking and reaching out to many other people. 
but it's still it's very small for telling that this is global. So this is beginning. We have uh, uh, go a lot far, far away from these six months of really hard work, but now we are, so we have now, for example, we are going to organize with the uh, um, caregivers and care workers, uh, an organ an, a meeting that will be like a general assembly among them and then with partners and, and possible supporters will have an exchange. And that will happen on May or June, we are still, building the concept node based on their needs and what they want to see. So for example, the Global Alliance of Care is a space to visibilize the voices of caregivers, which are mostly not visible. And we talk a lot about them, but they are not the ones who can be the real actors to say what they need and how to move forward in this. We are also <clears throat> organizing a side event on the CSW conference in, in New York that will be also linked to climate, of course, care and climate, because that's the issue. And it will be linked to the um, Action Coalition on Economic Justice and Action Coalition on Climate event that they are doing jointly. So it's pushing a lot the agenda. I would say there are governments that are very uh, engaged like the Canadian and the, and the German, German government as well as Spain. And there are others that are very proactive as Valeria mentioned in Latin America, Argentina, uh, Chile now, uh, Peru is approaching a lot and it's building their own uh, care system. And I would say in that sense that um, implementing care policies will be quite different from Europe to the United States or Latin America, Asia or Africa. No? And I think that Latin America is making a huge effort showing how this can be implemented in a different way. We don't have welfare states systems as it has in Europe. We, we have maybe in some of, of our countries, a kind of welfare state, social security, but has been dismantled over these three or four decades. So showing that and having feminist uh, people within the governments, it's critical and crucial. And I think that will be part of this global alliance of care. I would say that it's global, but we want to make a focus on the global South because it's where we need more. So a challenge for us is to reach out more people. We have Tanzania as a government, but we are now looking for other governments in Africa and in Asia. So we begin to, to, to make it really global. So I will stop here because maybe you have other kind of questions instead of continue presenting what we are doing. Really, really um, powerful reflections and so much information that you've shared. I think um, as a follow up, I know you mentioned to me when we spoke before that there were specific kind of near term things in terms of thinking about Germany's G7 presidency and also kind of approaching mm -hmm. this from a human rights mm -hmm. piece. So if you could speak to that. And then lastly, I know, you know, you also talked to me about how you're approaching context specific factors within the community of practice. So not just but also say thinking about the needs of indigenous women and, and kind of an indigenous community. So if you could just touch on those last two points, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, so first, uh, so the, I would say there are examples of governments that are really willing to promote this agenda and uh, the Argentina government jointly with the Mexico one presented an initiative to the UN uh, Human Rights Commission last year to integrate care as a human right. They have the signature of 50 states and they are you know, moving this forward. We know that the right of care could be also under the umbrella of the CEDO and other, other international uh, agreements, but we think this has to be happened. And this was under also the Global Alliance umbrella. So it's happening within this process. I don't know, I am not going to say that this wouldn't happen if the Global Alliance wouldn't exist. Of course it will happen, but it's, supporting that there is a space, a global space to push better and to advocate more. Uh, the second thing is that the, the presidency of Germany in the GC, it's absolutely committed to integrate care into the GC, G7, sorry, G7 agenda. So uh, one of the things that will come out from this side event on the CSW is how to build this uh, in a concrete way so they, they uh, integrate the, the care work within the agenda of G7. And also within the agenda of G20, the Mexican government has been also 
working on that. So this is one of the trends I would say on the, at the governmental and multilateral sector. On the side on, on how to integrate others. So, so there are some assumptions around care at the local level that it's very cost, the, the cost to implement services, care services, is very high cost for the governments. And this is a kind of pretext to say, this is very difficult, we are not going to be able. And there is some research already doing by UN Women in the case of Mexico, to how to demonstrate that this can be done. So I think this one, this, this could be one of the things that from the academia could be really helpful to really have a kind of analysis on what is the cost and how can be solved. I will go back to what Nancy said about solidarity and other schemes of work. And I think care workers could organize as cooperatives and that will bring other sphere of, of uh, in the economy rather than on corporations, you know? And that's something that has to be linked. Is the, the responsibility of the state, of course, but it has to, to, to be linked also with the corporate sector in terms of having policies, but also with the caregivers and how to support and strengthen them to give the services and to, but, and, and also to make it in a more collaborative way, you know? So I think there are some examples. And finally, I would say that we know this is a rural agenda, with a rural, uh, an urban agenda, and in the rural areas, it is not quite well understood and, and, and I would say how to integrate this care agenda. People, the indigenous people and rural people leads with the care of the elderly or the children or the, or the community or even the, the, the nature in a different way than we that are living in the cities. So this is something we need to go further to understand better. This is one of the things we would like to see in the, in the, uh, in the exchange of practices, of best, best practices. So we are going now to be launched by one of the members, the foundation ever, uh, ever the uh, Frederick Ebert Foundation is part of the Global Alliance for Care and they are willing to launch a community of practice around the norms around care, you know? Another layer we are, we are promoting around experiences is around care for different workshops uh, uh, with sharing experiences on the norms area or leg legislations, then another one on policies and services and how you do deal with that. Another one around local, like cities, you know, Bogota, Mexico City, Barcelona, another ones, you no, know, and sharing experiences. And then a full one that it's rural areas. How do we deal with that? We have some few examples, but that's why this repository of information that we want, to, we are beginning to design and create is so important. It's not that we are willing to have everything. We want to have like the links to say, hey, you are looking for this experience. Here is this information. Or these are all these articles or all these research surveys that you can look at to really design better your policy or your program. So those are the kind of things we are doing and reflecting. Thank you, Emilian. And I think already some exciting areas for potential collaboration coming out of this um, and your thoughts thus far. Uh, just one more thing. We have uh, we had not been so successful to engage the academia, honestly. So we need to work more on that. We are inviting you to be part of the Global Alliance for Care. But uh, and we are talking with some uh, networks of, of of uh, researchers in Latin America, but we need to expand this. So, um, and we have to acknowledge, we have been done a lot of work on that, but the academia, and yes, we want you to be here, but we haven't done our real work for that. Well, great. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here today. And I think there'll be a lot of, of people who are joining who are very excited to hear that and, and interested in joining. Um, with that, in terms of talking about Mary, you, you muted yourself. I sure did, I accidentally did that. Thank you, Valeria. Um, as I was saying, as we continue to kind of take stock of the global um, landscape, I now wanna to turn to Amr Nijawan. Um, as we think about developing a holistic care agenda at the global level, it is not only the reduction and redistribution of care work to the state at the domestic level, but also within foreign policy. Amar, your advocacy was instrumental in the Canadian government's $100 million commitment to care and foreign policy and assistance at the Generation Equality Forum. 
and your work has focused on in-depth analysis of the programmatic landscape on Claire care globally to really flesh out the details of what is being funded and what a feminist approach entails. The recently released Care Policy Scorecard, co-authored by Oxfam, ICRW Asia's office, and IDWF is another great resource for thinking granularly, granular, granularly in care policy and funding. Um, my question for you is, what has Oxfam's research and programming shown in terms of openings for policy in the care funding landscape? Thanks, Mary, for your great question and for organizing this amazing event um, with all these great speakers. Um, I think my answer is going to touch on different components of what everybody shared already, um, but hopefully it provides a bit of perspective from an advocacy um, uh, advocacy perspective. Um, so Oxfam's own journey on care spans almost a decade and has evolved from tools to understanding and measuring care work. Um, like the Care Policy Scorecard, but also through our We Care programs, but also, again, to an expanding body of care programming, advocacy, and campaigning with partners and allies globally. Um, and as Emilienne mentioned, taking into account different approach, approaches and varying lived realities between the Global North and the Global South and the countries that Oxfam covers. But in the last two years, as we've all been speaking to, the pandemic has really changed the narrative around care work. Uh, and the care economy globally, um, you know, globally and also here in Canada. We're seeing shifts in the public narrative, um, the policy responses to the care crisis, and really the value that's assigned to care work, um, which has also shifted the way in which governments, donors, multilateral agencies, and international financial institutions have recognized, if we want to use that word, how crucial care is uh, for our society to function. Um, and, and these bodies we're, we're noticing have started investing in and resourcing care research policies and programs um, within a broader gender-based analysis. But despite this global momentum and this amazing progress we're seeing, um, you know, we still need more actions and funding um, for donors in these states to address care holistically, uh, effectively, and sustainably. Um, and, and we do find um, in our position that care, uh, paid and unpaid care work continues to be sort of put on the sidelines in social and economic policy making um, at a mainstream level. Um, you know, we've seen care absent from big stimulus packages that after came after COVID-19. Nancy, you, you mentioned, you know, everything around the build, build Back Better in the States is an example of how we see the necessity, yet it's fraught when it's actually being legislated. Um, we also, you know, have been missing care um, and you know, emergency measures often announced at these big macro levels. So at Oxfam, we really believe that you know, now is the time for these you know, uh, donors to deliver on these investments and these commitments and to ensure again, that a feminist approach is taken to this. Um, so all of this kind of added to our ongoing advocacy with the Canadian government to start considering care um, not only as a domestic policy priority and agenda that childcare advocates in Canada have been pushing for decades and decades, but also how do we think about care in the context of international development assistance um, and in foreign and economic policy. Um, so I think there's three kind of main trends that I want to point to that kind of prompted these advocacy and policy openings for Oxfam Canada, but also other care advocates that have been trying to move this agenda in the last few years. Um, firstly, I'd like to point, as people have mentioned, the failures of care systems um, that prompted a response within certain governments to bolster you know, social protection. Um, from an example of Canada, it's been really evident over these past 20 months that uh, Canada's care economy was extremely pushed to the limits and decades of underspending have left health and care sectors in this country in a state of complete dysfunction. Um, the privatization, the ongoing privatization of essential supports like long-term care and housing uh, clearly failed to protect structurally marginalized communities at the worst moments of this pandemic. Um, and we were extremely, extremely pleased to see uh, the Canadian government invest uh, in a $30 billion national early learning and child care system, um, which is a huge step forward. Um, and again, as I mentioned, what advocates in this country have been uh, pushing for, for decades. Um, at the moment, this involves uh, federal negotiations with the provinces, um, but it actually lays out quite a clear plan of how a comprehensive child care system can be built in the next five years and takes into account also, you know, the human capital and workforce needs to support a, a child, um, you know, a child care system. So pushing that sort of domestic front um, was also very instrumental in how we frame this issue globally as well. 
Um, the second trend that you know we want to speak to, um, but was that COVID again has very clearly shown us the structural failure um, in our economic systems globally, as Nancy mentioned too in her framing, um, that continues to contribute to gender and racial inequality across the world. Um, Oxfam released uh, its annual Davos report um, last week. Uh, and I mean, it shouldn't take millions of people to die to make this clear, uh, but you know, uh, the, the data from the report told us that the world's 10 richest men uh, more than doubled their fortunes from 700 billion to 1.5 trillion during the first two years of this pandemic, while the incomes of 99% of the world uh, fell and more than 160 million more people were pushed into poverty. So Oxfam's message as we advocate for this at a global level continues to be that building back a better future cannot simply be a re-exercise of putting what was already there, but now is the moment to sort of envision a transformative new economic model that centers health, well-being, um, and of our people uh, and the planet. Um, building sort of strong care policies uh, for systems and systems of social protection that address the root of gender inequality are uh, crucial components in this approach. Um, and the third and sort of final trend that we were working around um, was really kind of complicating the narrative around women's economic empowerment um, and sort of critiquing the efficacy of the very market-driven development assistance and feminist foreign policy interventions um, around economic empowerment um, when paid and unpaid care uh, remains unaddressed in these interventions, how well do they really work? Um, you know, with even within sort of the broader landscape of women's economic empowerment programming um, and some landscape reviews that we've been doing, um, we're finding that it still receives uh, less than half of the financial investment from other DAC donor countries, um, you know, care specifically compared to other WE program areas. And of the sort of small share of women's economic empowerment programs that address care work right now, a lot of them are focused on childcare or recognizing and redistributing sort of unpaid domestic work. And while these are extremely important issues, um, you know, at Oxfam, we think that a sustainable feminist and gender transformative approach uh, requires investment so that, uh, you know, unpaid care and paid care workers are represented to, uh, are, are represented to ensure that interventions meet needs as um, Emilienne pointed to, and I'm really excited to hear um, and learn more about the outcomes of this meeting um, that is that the Global Alliance for Care are holding. You know, when we talk about care workers, um, it's a vast and diverse sector, but it often rests on the backbone of racialized women and racialized, uh, feminized, racialized labor. Um, in Canada, for example, there's nearly 25,000 migrant care workers, all of almost all who live in their employer's home that experienced um, horrible conditions during the pandemic and social protection systems weren't extended. So I think the experience of domestic and informal workers complicate our understanding of economic empowerment and really, really need to be at the center of these global and domestic discussions about how we talk about care. Um, so one thing that we constantly sort of advocate um, you know, with our partners, with our stakeholders, but in our conversations as the Canadian government is currently starting to develop and uh, think about how you know, we're going to spend these investments, how we're going to sort of put into systems, you know, we really uh, strongly believe in standalone approaches um, need to be at the root of this, that, you know, the current inequalities that we're seeing can't be solely addressed through add-on or mainstreamed approaches to women's economic empowerment um, as great, you know, steps as they are, um, you know, something like uh, a, a large scale jobs training program, having a child care center on, on, on its sideline, which is an, often an intervention we see in the WE space is important, but it doesn't tackle the symptoms of, of this problem, the symptoms of the inequality that we're seeing. Um, so we do believe that funding kind of standalone interventions rooted in research, advocacy programming um, that can tackle and address all the five R's of care that we've been referring to throughout. Um, in collaboration with women's rights organizations and grassroots women's rights organizations will deliver the, the solutions to the root causes of these core problems. Um, and before I wrap up, Mary, I just want to bring attention to an example of one of these standalone programs. Um, Oxfam Canada um, has a project um, in Bangladesh called Securing Rights that works directly with uh, domestic workers across the country. Um, it is one of the first of its kind to be funded by the Canadian government. And I think a lot of donor governments that focus explicitly on um, the increasing the well being and addressing paid care workers. Um, it, the project is about uh, looking to reach, it's in its, uh, you know, 
more than halfway through the few years, but has reached almost 16,000 domestic workers um, with the aim of strengthening the agency and the advocacy to um, you know, defend rights, to speak to the national laws and legislations that regulate domestic workers, um, you know, to improve social norms, uh, change around men and women's roles um, and society's roles and how we distribute care, um, and really sort of increased recognition of domestic work as a formalized pro profession that's regulated and protected. Um, and the project works with you know, local partners, including the private sector, women's rights organizations. Again, as um, Valeria was mentioning earlier, this like broad-based multi-sectoral approach that's required to implement these kinds of policies. Um, so I'll wrap up there and just sort of echoing uh, that what we see domestically, we want to see globally with uh, donor governments. Um, and we're really excited that, you know, Canada is taking a leadership role in the Global Alliance for Care um, and excited to be an organization um, like Oxfam that's really trying to hold these governments accountable. Once you make your commitment, what's what's happening after? Thank you so much for that. I think you shared a wealth of information there in terms of how we start to think about, as you said, extending what's happening domestically to thinking about foreign policy and what we want donor governments to do and, and, and some specific kind of programmatic elements, right, and what it means to take this real feminist approach. So now, as we've heard from all the speakers kind of across this spectrum, right, from theory to practice, I want to pose some questions to all of our speakers. Um, you'll have a couple minutes just to kind of pull out some maybe were kind of most top line um, pieces in response to these. And that's, how can we integrate these insights from theory to move beyond words from policymakers to concrete actions that are sustainable and provide a holistic approach? Many of you, you know, touched on this already. Where should we push to utilize momentum and create meaningful change? And where are there gaps that we can work together to fill? So I'm going to now turn to our speakers um, in, in order. So I'm going to start with you again, Nancy. Ah, I think these are really great questions, but I also think they're very specific to particular, uh, you know, to particular communities and particular environments. Um, so, I mean, I feel like what we're doing here is we're really learning about examples and kind of models and possibilities and so forth and so on. But um, I guess I don't have a particular action plan uh, right now that I feel like would be kind of necessarily relevant beyond my own uh, kind of place. I do, I do just want to say though that I think um, as much as I love that word action, I think it's it is also really important to change the way people think. And that is to that's an action too. <laughs> it takes a lot of energy to try to do it. And so I think we we should consider that as part of our repertoire, that the kind of the cultural and the social and the media and the, um, you know, conversations with friends and neighbors, that's, that's all stuff that needs to be added into the policy initiatives and really be a part of it. I love that. I think that's right. And I would argue too, exactly, that changing social norms requires action, right? <laughs> It's a, a process that can happen. I think there, yeah. there are kind of tangible examples of how yeah. um, states, the private sector, others can, can really lead in this, this way to, to, to start um, encouraging that change to happen. So thank you, Nancy. Um, Valeria, I'll now turn to you. Yeah, I, I wanted to um, flag uh, something that I didn't say because I was focusing on investments and investments certainly have to be in education and care, but for the ILO, care workers are, the care workforce, let's say, is all the workforce in education, all the workforce in health, and all the workforce in domestic work. And I think that having, and that has been a view from the South. Uh, we were worried about domestic, I mean, concerned and, and on, on, on improving um, their, their working conditions. Uh, now, Kootobe has just uh, shared the Convention 189 about domestic workers, and I think the in in the report, two issues emerge about them. One that it's correlated with inequality, and that also that's why Amar was so emphatic about them, and, and not so much with levels of income. If if a society is egalitarian in terms of income it has low levels of domestic workers. Uh, that's, that's, that's one thing. And in, in, in fact, in Latin America, what we see is these high levels of, of 
domestic workers, particular important, I mean, and very feminized, more feminized than in other regions that are those who close the gaps when, when um, uh, care services fail. The problem is that those are closed only for the households that can pay for them. So um, improving the situation of, of, of domestic workers is one thing to do, certainly. But the other thing, and it, it connects with something Emilian says, um, yes, investments in, in care sectors and in care policies are expensive. And, um, and I don't think that we can escape that. So what we have to do, and I think we've been doing, and I've just posted um, uh, a joint program, the link for a joint program, UN Women and the ILO, uh, we are doing, uh, and, 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 and in which exercises like the one Emilian mentioned for Mexico and um, are being done for, for several countries um, using a tool that again, um, IPEC did and, and emerged from the work in the care report. Um, and, and in, but the, the point is, it, it is cost, it's costly. We have to cost. We can uh, have a universal view, but a, a roadmap to, to do this investment. It's not everything or nothing. So, so uh, but I think that we have to, to, to do this exercise, this costing exercises, um, to connect uh, with those ambitions, the SDG ambitions, for example, and, and the need for finding sources of fund, uh, the financing of this. But we cannot only speak as a narrative and then do not tackle these issues. But I would insist that the pandemic proved the cost of not having those services. Yeah. And those are enormous and far bigger than making these investments. So I think that that is an argument we will have to insist uh, and, and on and use to open the door for doing this detailed and, 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 and um, yeah, sometimes complex costing exercises and start um, building the momentum and the knowledge for these investments to take place. I would, I would propose that. Thank you, Valeria. Amazing. Um, Emilian and Amar, I'm going to turn to you both now. If you can just try and keep your reflections short so we have time for Q&A. Um, thank you so much. Yes, uh, I, I think this, this issue around costing, it's really critical uh, because I think it's high cost, but if we manage as an investment instead of, instead of high cost, you know, the concept is quite different. If I am, if this is costing, it's an expenditure. If I am I'm investing, it's something to grow, to provoke growth and the benefits of, of the society. So I think even the concept of what does it mean to invest and what will be the gains, I think it's quite what, what Valeria is saying. I think that's something that it's, it's critical. I also think that um, the role of caregivers, it's, it's also something that we have to take more in account and give more the, the voices of them. So if we want to build equality, we need to listen to them and to be them their sense, the, themselves the actors of this. Not only the all of us that are always uh, looking for solutions, but they know how to make the solutions. And I will link this to another concept of care. Valeria said it's in education, health and domestic work, yes. But I think the, the, the natural resources that are being cared by women in, in most of the countries has to be also taken in count as care because it's taking care of the society. If the lake is not clean, there is no resources for that community. And the women are the ones who are. And I think this intersection between care or, or economic empowerment and climate could link also to care uh, uh, policies and, and in the agenda. So expand the, the concept of care. And I know that will bring a lot of, you know, always obstacles, always uh, resistance, but we, as I, I am part of a small group of 
of friends that we call all feminists, we call ourselves insistentialistas, insistentialists. So we insist, 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 and persist. So this is the way we have to continue working here, never abandon. We will move forward to two steps, but and maybe three back, but and just to give you. I think the case of Uruguay, who has already a very good care system, but the political administration now is not interested in selling care. So these things are going to happen in many. Now we have Boric in, in Chile, we are just sending kisses and whatever it happens, I think it will be great. But this is something as always, the feminist agenda is like a dancing, no? We move forward and then steps back, but just pushing more. As much as we can see this as a collective action with the grassroots organizations, academia, international institutions, civil society organizations, governments, et cetera, I think we can move on. The advocacy efforts should be also within all the, the sectors. Great, thank you so much, Amelia and Omar. Um, yeah, thanks so much. And I, I completely agree. Um, Emilian, you're giving me some ideas for uh, group chat names with my feminist friends right now. So I love that. Um, I also completely agree with the idea of how we can expand the concept and interconnect care um, from our experiences working with the Canadian government right now, like that linkage between care and climate, that linkage between care and, um, you know, humanitarian uh, disaster issues and how we're sort of like localizing the agenda around humanitarian assistance is something that we're also trying to put our minds around. Um, also, I uh, completely agree with the idea of that, you know, it, it's, it's, costly to invest, but costly not to invest. Um, it's so helpful to have these tools and resources. Um, I'm uh, hoping that someone puts everything in the chat box in one document, because I think um, the, the range of tools, the first thing we get you know, asked when our advocacy efforts is like, how much is this gonna, is this gonna cost us? And what we're constantly trying to explain is that the cost of inaction is far greater. Um, also a recommendation put up by Oxfam is that, you know, the, the massive new wealth that's been accumulated since the start of the pandemic by these, what, 27 billionaires, um, you know, how can we start taxing uh, in progressive ways uh, through permanent wealth and, and capital taxes to reallocate that money to build better care systems um, is something to think about. Uh, but yeah, I think there's there's a few things that we need to consider to ensure that you know care policies and systems are built and rooted in an intersectional, inclusive feminist approach. Um, I think you know continually framing care as a priority in, in international cooperation, development, and foreign policy spaces has to be at the top of mind. Um, agree with some points made about how we have to tackle social norms changes. Um, uh, we also have to frame care as an infrastructure issue as well, and sort of promote sort of care transformative changes and sorry care responsive changes in, in uh, public services and how you know the provision of basic services and, and roads and and infrastructure how, how we've traditionally been told to see it changes entirely when you add this care lens to it um i think there's also sort of technology and social protection policies that can be used to advance this um and uh, you know, again, at the end of the day, really lending expertise and platforms to women's rights organizations, to caregivers, to care caregivers organizations to, you know, amplify these ideas around, you know, domestic work, paid work, work in the home, um, in macroeconomic policy and decision making. Um, I think one thing and Valerie mentioned was really, you know, um, making moves on things that the governments have been sitting on a long time that has the opportunity to improve the rights of caregivers, um, like ratifying uh, Convention 189 of the ILO um, and, you know, pushing to create better labor standards. Um, and I don't know, finally, I mean, this might be very, but how do we sort of continue to measure growth beyond metrics like the GDP and, and recognize the unpaid, unrecognized reproductive labor that women and femme do in our everyday life. Um, and I, I really like how Nancy framed it, that these are these are conversations that we have to have um, every day from, from the small to the big. Wonderful. A lot that I could say to that, but I wanna make sure that we have time for our attendees to ask questions as well. Um, Jihi, um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn to you to help um, moderate. It looks like we do have a couple hands up. I think given time, um, we'll probably just take two questions and then um, give our participants a chance to answer those. Yeah, um, and also I'll just quickly address in the comments, yes, all of these resources will be put on a list, so please don't worry about trying to save this chat because there's a lot in it. 
Um, so yeah, why don't we just take both questions at the same time? Um, we'll start with Alia and then after that Marina and you can just unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity. I'm uh, talking from Islamabad, Pakistan. And um, my question is about uh, a database or a registry of uh, care workers, because in Pakistan, um, 90% of the care workers are unregistered workers because uh, they work in the so-called informal economy. So what are the thoughts about, uh, you know, documenting um, and uh, registering uh, care workers uh, sectorally and recognizing care as an economic sector? Uh, thank you very much. Go ahead, Marina. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is Marina Durano, and I recently joined a the Uni Global Union. The Uni Global Union. We can't hear you, uh, you, Marina. If you. Uh, okay. This is. Uh, how is this? Uh, is this better? Much better. I, I just joined the Uni Global Union, and we organize the care workers in the private sector. So one of the things that are important is also to understand the industrial structure of uh, private sector uh, care provisioning. Uh, multinationals are already in this space, but we also find that private equity and real estate trust companies are controlling uh, this sector and, and in ways that reduce, uh, that result in the reduction of staffing. And of course, reduction in staffing leads to poor quality care uh, and therefore, uh, you have not only a, uh, a decline in working conditions, but also the quality of patient care reduces. So I think there's an issue of financialization uh, in the care sector, in the private care sector that needs to be unpacked uh, and understood better. Um, and we're, we in the union ha, are, are really trying to figure out new ways and methods to organize a very fragmented sector, especially because there's heavy subcontracting, but funded by public money. Uh, so especially in the when there are reimbursements involved, you know, in social security. So the financing question is a big deal, not only from a private uh, investment, uh, private uh, I mean, not only from public side, but how the private investors are creating standards that are un utterly unacceptable is also something that requires our attention. I really hope that the researchers in this room could provide us uh, ammunition so that we can support our uh, care workers on the ground. Thank you so much. Thank you both for such thoughtful questions. Um, I'm going to turn it back to our panelists. Um, I'll go ahead and start kind of from reverse order this time. Um, Amar, I'll come to you first as, and give you a chance to answer. Uh, no, those are both uh, really great questions. Um, and thank you, Mariana, for speaking um, to the role of I feel like saying the role of the private sector kind of collapses the differences between you know industries and, and ways in which workers are regulated, but um, it's definitely something that has to be sort of taken into account. Um, I think that you know the immediate realities of a lot of care workers and folks who receive care um, do uh, across the world, um, and especially in like certain global south contexts, like. Uh, are mainly all employed by the, the private sector and the way in which benefits are shrewd, the way in which um, uh, like negotiations are allowed, the way that your day-to-day -day life is run is, is through the jobs. So there's a huge transformative impact that could happen if uh, more services are provided by, by employers. Um, but I, I, I agree with you. I don't think I have an answer to your question, but I would really, really sort of be interested in exploring that further, how, you know, private investors are creating an acceptable standards, how that can be regulated in a way that benefits and supports care workers. Um, and also sort of going back into the uh, previous question, you know, um, yeah, of course the, the um, realities of, of, of informal workers and domestic workers aren't like act actively captured in these statistics either, but at the same time are the ones um, who 
are able to or, or don't receive benefits uh, through through private employers. Um, and these employers are often, like you mentioned, like households that employ domestic workers and informal workers, um, which makes me really excited about projects like the one I mentioned, um, the Securing Rights Project in Bangladesh, which is like looking to work with domestic workers to enhance national legislations. So there, there was a national law that was passed, I think four or five years ago around um, regulating uh, the domestic work and, and creating standards around it from the state, but like how are domestic workers and informal workers themselves participating in these processes? So I'm um, happy to share more resources about that project and where it's coming from, especially speaking to um, you know, a South Asian context and, and, and where this type of um, care work and informal works exist pretty specifically. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that and pass it to other panelists to tackle the questions. Thank you so much. I will now turn to Emilienne. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would say an example in Mexico around how to register uh, care workers. Um, and uh, it's linked to what just Amar said about legislation. We have now the recognition of care work, domestic work as a, as a, as a work, as a labor, uh, as, as labor, and we have now it's uh, from the labor ministry the, and the social security uh, institution. We can register as a household, as a, as an employer of uh, domestic workers, and you pay the the social security for this for these people. Of course, it has still it's it has only one year, one year and a half that it's working and it has some problems as any, any kind of systems. And it hasn't reached out a lot of people because this is also a cultural shift. So we have like 40,000 people registered from uh, two, more than 2 million domestic workers that we know that exist in Mexico. And this is also because the households, or the, you know, they don't want to listen about this. So we need to make this kind of cultural norms where we have to acknowledge that if we have someone working with us at the home, helping us to do all the work at home, they need to be, to have the social security to be well paid. And this is a cultural really shift, which is not easy to tap, but we have to work on that. So just to give an example that even could be um, a good example for you in, in, in Islamabad. Uh, and so Marina, well, I, I think it's more a, a question for researchers rather than for, for us as, as, the, as, the, as the Alliance, but I would say that it is not so easy to work with the private sector. They first they have this kind of thing that we do the things in our own way. We are very practical. Things are done very well, and we don't want any politics in here. And I'm sorry, but they are within uh, the politics, no matter if they want or not. But how to tackle this? And for the Global Alliance for Care, it's it's a challenge. So we have done some progress with the Mexican. Uh, corporate sector, and I would say some progress, not all, but at the international level, it has been difficult. What I know is that the, the uh, not the Me Too, the um, Time's Up uh, initiative has a special group on care, and many companies are joining that. What it's doing that we still don't know, and we are going to figure out to uh, reach out them, but this could be very helpful for you to understand. We are developing a guide for the corporate sector on how to implement policies in their companies. And we are going to publish it very soon. It's a very simple guide. We are also looking at the norms that already exist in Mexico and link to that and link to international norms, of course. And then finally, there is a, a, a civil society organization in Argentina that it's also part of the Global Alliance of Care its name is ELA, and they have a system where uh, it's a software system where the corporate sector or the companies can get in and like a self-assessment of the, if they are doing well or not of what they should be doing. So we are also willing to organize with them uh, a workshop to understand how is it working and to invite the private sector. So it's like step by step inviting them and it's I don't know we need to think about different strategies because what just Amar said about this Oxfam report around one two 
1.3 trillion over two years, just 27 people. This is just, we need to do something. I don't know what it is, but we need to do something around it. And it's not so easy because the, I would say the regulations, this economic system has deregulated the corporate sector. And that is not giving us the space to do much more advocacy on that. So we need to be very smart and, and joint efforts within, and we cannot just push back them. We need to get them with us and try to figure out. So there will be like some spaces that will be pushing them, you know, very radical and that's good. And some others that has to work. And I think the Global Alliance of Care needs to be a space where the corporate sector can get in be invited and feel that we can have some solutions to push better the care agenda in that sector. Thank you, Emilian. Um, Valeria. I, I think a uh, lot, I, I had mentioned before uh, the issue of uh, formalizing domestic workers. Uh, so, so and, and a lot has been said, but let me just read from the care report. Public provision of care services tends to improve the working condition of care workers. This is a finding after analyzing uh, multiple situations across the globe. And unregulated private provision worsens working conditions regardless of the level of income in the country. And the report shows that regulations ensuring the right of care workers are key as low and unequal earnings, informality, long working hours, and non-standard forms of employment take particular forms among care workers. One other message that we, and I, I'm really convinced, and, and this takes uh, from work uh, from Nancy, is that the care of the of the working the, the sorry, the, the quality of the care, working conditions of care workers is the quality of the care provided. And therefore, we need to forge alliances between those who are uh, the, the recipients, the users, the, the care recipients, and those who provide care uh, as a job. Uh, I think that was what Emiliana wanted to say before, as, as, as uh, an employed position. So, so it's not public against private per se, but certainly, it, it, it doesn't have to be at the cost of uh, working conditions for care workers or the quality of the care provided. And inequality, and this is the last thing I will say, in a, when we leave, the problem with leaving um, unregulated services and, and, and leaving care to be provided by the market is that it, it, it copies the inequality existing in the economy because only those who pay for the services or can pay for the services have access. And this reinforces inequality. So, and, and again, it reinforces bad or, or deficient working conditions for some care workers who are uh, pressured to uh, engage in low wage um, working conditions or, or, or um, um, yeah, jobs, because there is this pressure to lower, uh, to, to lower prices and to, to generate uh, profit out of the, the care provision. So I would say that good uh, working conditions for care workers is good care for care receivers could be the way in which we think um, uh, out of this conundrum. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. Nancy. Well, first of all, I'm just awestruck by this whole conversation. I thought it was incredibly productive and also like really, really encouraging, empowering um, in so many ways. I, um, I just want to say, uh, as somebody who's, you know, lived in the economics world uh, for most of my life, of teaching economics that we also need to really push for a change in the way economics is taught. And we need to be developing, you know, material for introductory econ courses and teaching courses about care and, and being 
insist, insistentialists about changing the economic curriculum. You know, there are a lot of concepts in our uh, con our theoretical vocabulary that are useful, social costs, public goods, consumer sovereignty. Um, and I really think we need to look, in addition, I think, while it's important to think about the care sector, broadly defined, paid and unpaid, it's also really important to talk about the social costs imposed on society as a whole and, and the form of like dead weight losses, like, crime and drug addiction and mental illness and all of these things that are sort of unthinkingly kind of really not, not ever, they're not ever really added up and factored into gross domestic product. And there is kind of a history of efforts to interrogate GDP, not just adding in unpaid work, but also subtracting out uh, the costs of, of kind of cleaning up after um, kind of social dysfunction. And um, I think finally, I just want, want to say, I think we should really start using the term social climate, changing the social climate, because that climate word really clarifies the parallels uh, that everybody here has emphasized with uh, the physical climate and climate change. And really that's what we're talking about is improving the overall social climate. So thanks everybody for really great discussion. Thank you, Nancy. And I think that's a great way to transition into some kind of final reflections um, from our, our panelists. So um, since those are some great last kind of tie up words from you, Nancy, I'll, I'll turn back um, now to Amelia for some, some last reflections. Well, first of all, thank you very much. I'm amazed to be in this, in this session with 120 people that are some amazing thinkers. And I think this is a very powerful space. So thank you to ICRW to organize this. Honestly, it's, it's for us, it's an honor as the Global Alliance of Care. And honestly, we want to invite you to be part of the Global Alliance of Care. We are inviting more that individuals organizations. So if you are part of a network or your university or a specific group, that will be great for us. And, and I think uh, the Global Alliance for Care could be a space to push better the agenda to, to make possible or feasible the implementation of some legislations, policies, and even try to do some cultural changes because that's something that we also need. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Emilian. Amar, I'll turn to you. Um, I just wanna echo uh, what Emilian said. It's been so wonderful to be in conversation with such um, brilliant thinkers who've really shaped my thinking on care over the years. So it's kind of a starstruck moment for me, but also just to have so many people in the space sharing links and resources, it does add a lot of uh, hope uh, to this agenda uh, and for folks who work on this every day. Um, I wanna end off by repeating slogans and words that I've heard other panelists use because I'm gonna start using it all the time. So first, Valeria, you know, good work, good working conditions is good care for care receivers is the way forward. Um, and, uh, and Nancy, uh, you know, investing in care is really going to change our social climate. So I'll, I'll end on that. And thanks again for having, having me here. Thank you so much, Amar. Valeria. I think it was, it was wonderful. And I, I love the chat in, it's a generous chat. Is, 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 uh, people are, are sharing all the work that, that we, we are collectively as a community doing. But it also shows that we are talking here amongst um, uh, those convinced. Uh, so we have lots of work to do out there. Uh, and, and again, the, the nitty gritty political uh, work uh, that is required at so many levels from Oxfam's uh, report to the Global Alliance, to the call for action in the case of the ILO, the work 
uh, by UN Women. I, 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 I shared some materials uh, we, we are working together with. And, and, and then the work at the, at the country level, at the local level, in organizing, in uh, mobilizing. Uh, these things, and, and we also learned that in Latin America, and I'm pretty sure we all share that, uh, <laughs> we are not going to gain them just because it, it is handed to us. Uh, it, it is the result of, of sustained and hard uh, fights that we've, and the, those our mothers and our daughters. Um, we, we say that in in feminist uh, in the feminist movement in, in in Argentina, we are the daughters of the abuelas de Plaza de Mayo. We are the uh, mothers of of this young mobiliza mobilization that that is so progressive in in Argentina. So um, I um, I live invigorated. Uh, it, fundamentally by this generosity, uh, but we we have lots of lots of work to do and uh, we will need each other to, to make progress. I will stop there, thank you. A really wonderful note to leave us on. I, I couldn't agree more. I think there's a lot of inspiration and energy, right? Coming from today's session around what we can achieve together, but ultimately we do need to take this out further. My hope from today is that this is you know, part of an ongoing conversation, right? The, the beginning of, of new areas where we can work together and so we can harness this momentum and, and keep this going. There are you know, slogans, framings, you know, concrete actions, a lot that we can take from this panel, but we need to continue this work, right? The time is critical in COVID and there is so much to take forward. So we will make sure and you know, collate all the resources from the chat and save them um, and share them with you. We wanna make sure that um, you know, we, we, as I said, keep this conversation going. So we'll look for more areas where we can continue talking um, as the Global Alliance, you know, continues to grow. I hope that we can, um, you know, collectively engage with that. And especially for those of you that are researchers, um, think about how to create really valuable and relevant research for policy. I think Nancy's statements about the ways we need to think about teaching economics are incredibly powerful too, especially within this IAFI space. I know we're, we're all bought into that largely already, but still things to think about how we can create change. Um, thank you to all for joining today. Please look out for future events in the Building Bridges series. Um, and as I said, other IAFI events that we have this season on research methods and about building a career um, as a feminist economist. Please reach out with any questions or follow-ups to me or to the other panelists. Um, and I hope you all have a great day and continue taking this inspiration out. Best wishes to you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye.